Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for truth. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have sent to lead us into truth. And Father, we ask right now, Lord, that by your Spirit, that you'd be pleased to open the eyes of our understanding, that our ears would hear, that our eyes would see, that our hearts would receive. Lord, the revelation of your word, of your truth. Father, I pray that we would receive wisdom, that you would grant us spiritual understanding. Lord, give us conviction of truth, words of faith and salvation. Father, I ask that you would speak through me words that you would have spoken, that your spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I might write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And you may be seated, hallelujah. Today we're gonna get into a new series study that we'll be in for some time now. It'll uh, my plan is, is to cover this topic, the unseen war, in three different volumes. We're going to start volume one today as we talk about good and evil, and then we'll be in that for a few weeks, and then we'll, we'll begin volume two, where the topic will be kings and pawns, and I'm going to show you in the word that, that, that basically everybody, all the citizenship of planet earth is either operating as a king or a pawn. A pawn is someone that's being used to advance the agenda of another. But if you've been born again and you know Jesus is Savior, you've been called to operate as kings in the earth, advancing his will. That we're about, we're about to show you that here in verse 10. And then volume three, we're going to talk about the three domains of Satan's kingdom that I think is going to shed a lot of light on what's going on in the world and, and what the enemy's doing and has been doing since the beginning of time because ultimately Satan has three domains in his kingdom, an economical domain, a political domain, and a religious domain, yes and amen. So that's gonna be intense. But I wanna start with the unseen war and talk about good and evil. When you talk about good and evil, good and evil are contrasted in the Bible. If, if you're studying the King James Bible, the wording of good and evil, the, the contrasting of the two show up 98 times in Scripture. 98 times they're contrasted good and evil, 33 times in the New Testament alone. And so if you're studying a topic and you can find something mentioned that many times, then you know it must be a truth. And so that's what we'll be getting into for the next few weeks. Now, I want to I want to lay a, a foundation of where this series is going, and and I just have the utmost confidence that if you will pay attention to the Word of God, and just take these scriptures home, meditate on them, read them. If you study the Word, you're going to see in this series the world differently. There's no way you'll view the, your life, your marriage, parenting, your children, what's going on in society, what's happening in this world. There's no way you'll view it the same once you begin to see the scriptures that we're going to cover in this series. You'll see that there is in reality this unseen war that's going on over our lives, over our marriages, over our children, over the church. And I, I think so much is going to begin to make sense as we get into this. But I want to I wanna start with a simple truth that every believer needs to understand that's come, that comes here from Matthew chapter number six. Now, if you'll notice in Matthew chapter six, we just read before the prayer in verses nine and 10, but if you'll notice, if you back all the way up to chapter five and you look at Matthew chapter five and then you look at chapter six and then you go to chapter seven, you'll find that there are three whole chapters there where just about everything spoken is in the red. Why is it in the red? Did it run out of black ink? No, it, it's because th this signifies that Jesus is speaking. So when you study Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you're reading what is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's also called the Manifest of the King. It is where Jesus is laying out 
in what would be his longest sermon, he's laying out the culture of his kingdom, the manners of his kingdom, the way his kingdom operates. And right in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us this instruction in prayer that starts here in Matthew 6, verse number nine. Now, if you've been around Word of God at any length, then you know this is something that I cite quite often and will continue to cite. Because when you look at God's Word from cover to cover, the common theme of his word is his kingdom. I think there are too few Christians that really understand the kingdom of God and that when we were born again, when you accepted Christ as savior, according to what Jesus taught us in John chapter three, you were born again by his spirit into his kingdom, that every born again believer has entered into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the premier message of God's word. The first gift that God gave man when he created man in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, the very first thing that God gave man was dominion. King Jesus, King God, the owner and, and, and ruler of heaven and earth gave Adam, gave man dominion. When you look at the word kingdom, the word kingdom just means the king's dominion. The king's domain, you can write the word kingdom, separate king from D-O-M, and you see that compound nature of that word, it represents the king's domain, the king's dominion. The kingdom of God is mentioned 122 times in the New Testament. It was the first message of John the Baptist. It was the first message of Jesus. In John 17, when Jesus is standing before Pilate, right before he gave himself to be crucified, Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? That was his only concern. And Jesus said back, you said it. And then he made this statement. He said, for this reason I was born. Jesus was saying, the reason I came into the earth was for the purpose of the kingdom of God. Too few believers understand the kingdom. You know, I think we even look at this prayer in Matthew 6. You know, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Many look at that as a prayer we teach our children but we ourselves as adults don't pray. When Jesus was not teaching this as a prayer that we give our eight-year-old that one day you become more knowledgeable and wise and you grow out of this baby prayer. No, this was a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. It was the prayer that he incorporated in his sermon here. And he said, this is the manner that you ought to pray. And when you look at the prayer itself, it addresses the Father in heaven but in verse 10, you get the first petition of the prayer. And the first petition of the prayer is, read it, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. That's the first thing that we're asking for in this prayer. Jesus would teach later in this chapter down in verse 33 that when it comes to the necessities of life, what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna drink, what you're gonna wear, how you gonna pay your insurance and your rent money, come on somebody. He says when it comes to the needs of life, Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, seek first, help me if you know it, seek first the kingdom of God. And then he said all this other stuff will be added to you. So it's this kingdom first mindset, not kingdom on Sunday mindset. Because I'm concerned that's what's hurting the body of Christ right now and causing us not to have an influence on society is that somehow or another we have separated all things sanctified from all things secular and we try to put Jesus and his word and truth and righteousness and the kingdom in a box called Sunday and then we live all the other days of the week differently than what we, not, not y'all, somebody else, than what we do on Sunday and, and we, we, we really don't even give God one day of the week because it's, it's not like we give him more than two hours on Sunday. I mean, we, we show up late and we, and we leave early. None of y'all, somebody else. 
And we've got to get out of this dual mindset where we've separated what's sanctified from what is secular and recognize that the Lord has called us as citizens of his kingdom, that we have been called seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 52 weeks a year to advance the kingdom of God. That's the call. That's the mandate on our life is that we be kingdom heirs and, and live for the advancement of his kingdom. Even when Jesus established the church in Matthew 16, 19, the first gift that he gave the church when he said, upon this church, I, I build, uh, upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The first gift that he gave the church, he said, I give unto thee the keys. The keys of what? The keys of the kingdom and what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Even to the church, Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom. In other words, we need to have a kingdom mindset in everything that we do, in our marriage, in raising our children, in the way we do ministry, in the way we live our lives, the way we go to work, the way we do our job, the way we operate as citizens. We as the body of Christ have got to adapt to a kingdom mindset. So he says that here, this in verse 10. He says, pray like this, thy kingdom come. So what does that mean when you call on the kingdom of God? What, what does that even look like when you call on the kingdom of God? How simple is it? Thy kingdom come. Watch how simple it is. Thy, read it with me. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So notice, when the kingdom of God is come, then the will of heaven, the will of heaven is being done in the earth. When I'm living for the kingdom of God, I'm living for the will of God. And I'm taking the will of heaven and I am advancing it in the earth. I'm taking God's will as it is in heaven and I'm advancing it in the earth. Well, how do you find the will of God? God tells us in, in Isaiah 55, verse 8, he says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. And then he makes this statement. He said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. So, Lord, how do I get to know your will and your way? Because you yourself have said that your ways and your will is as high from me as the heavens are to the earth. He says this in verse number 11 of Isaiah 55. After saying in verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, he then, three verses later in verse 11, says that that is why he has sent us his word, that we might know his ways, that we might know his will. He has given us his word. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We know the will of God is the word of God. The ways of God are revealed in the word of God. And living with the kingdom mindset means that I'm living to advance the word of heaven in the earth, the will of heaven in my marriage, the will of heaven in my children, the will of heaven in my finances, the will of heaven in my neighborhood, the will of heaven in Shreveport, Louisiana, or wherever you're watching this broadcast. Now, I'm talking about advancing the will of heaven in the earth. That's the kingdom mandate that's been given to every born-again believer. But if we live with this mindset that the Bible was only written as some religious book that we open up on Sunday, and we only read it and, and practice it on Sunday, and every other day we throw it in the back dash of our car and forget everything that we read, if we live with that mindset, there's no way we can change what's going on in the streets of our city. There's no way we can change what's happening in our schools and with our young people and with our children if we separate this day-to-day -day life from his word. No, I'm going to show you in this word God's got a purpose for you. God's got a plan for you. He has given you his word. He has given you his spirit and greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world and he has called you to advance his will as it is is in heaven, in the earth. Do you believe that? 
Now, surely you can't clap your hands right now like you did, like a bunch of seals. Surely we can't just clap like seals and say amen, 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 and not know that the enemy is not going to just sit back and let the will of heaven be advanced in the earth without some kind of opposition. That's why Jesus would say the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent will take it by force. That's why after giving the church the keys to the kingdom, he would tell the church, now the gates of hell shall not prevail. What was he saying? He was saying there's going to be a war. There's going to be opposition against you advancing the kingdom. And this isn't just Old Testament stuff. There's an unseen war that, that goes on over society and over our city and over our communities and over the church and over our lives and our marriages and our children. There's an unseen war and it's as simple as the war between good and evil. Now, watch what Jesus does here in this prayer. Watch what he teaches us. He says, pray like this, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So I'm living to advance the will of heaven in the earth. Now, I'll I'll keep reading through the prayer, but I want to highlight the way the prayer ends in verse 13. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, help me, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. So notice, notice the wording here in verse 13, how the prayer closes. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. The, the Jesus' prayer, Jesus' prayer includes deliverance from evil. This is what Jesus said we ought to be praying. If Jesus tells me, you better pray for deliverance from evil, then I better know evil is a reality. And it's not just a reality, it is something that I need to be delivered from, which means without the kingdom of God, I am subject to. So he says, he says pray like this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and we'll talk more about these other items, but in verse 13 he says, and lead us not into temptation." But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, come with me to the book of John, the gospel of John, and I want to go to the seventh chapter. John, chapter number uh, chapter number seven. And I want to show you something that Jesus says down here in, in verse number seven. So Jesus said, evil is something that we need to be delivered from. So what is evil? I was at a conference a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C. It was a biblical worldview conference. It was held at the Bible Museum in Washington, which is an amazing place. It's uh, uh, over 300,000 square feet of everything you could ever imagine that's related to the Word of God. And it it, it is truly awesome. Uh, I would highly encourage you to take your kids there just to visit the the, the Bible Museum in Washington. So the conference was being held there. And, And... the whole conference was on the importance of, of, of educating our children with a biblical worldview. And there was, there was a video that was shown where the guy went around in, in various cities in the United States asking a simple question. Is there a difference between good and bad or good and evil? And you wouldn't believe the number of people that could not answer the simple question, Does that, do both exist? It was amazing to hear people's mindset that they couldn't answer the simple question, is there a difference between good and bad? And, and, and it was like people did not want to answer it. That's where we are as a society. We don't want to say anything is good or anything is evil because what might be good to me might, you know, or evil to me might be good to you. And so I don't want to say nothing. I'm just going to just keep this to myself. All right? But watch what Jesus says here in John 7. And I want to say just a little bit about evil. Synonyms to the word evil are wicked and even the word devil. 
And when you study it in Hebrew and you study it in Greek, you see all of these words that describe evil. And I was like, man, if I read all of this, it would take me 10 minutes. And, and so I, what, I, what, I, what I came to the conclusion of when I study this word in Scripture is that anything that is contrary to the word, character, will, or purpose of God is evil. Anything that is contrary, any word, any deed, any action that is contrary to the word, character, will, or purpose of God is evil. In other words, Satan's agenda is to take whatever is of God and pervert it. To take whatever is of God and change it, twist it. A synonym that you'll often find in Scripture to the word evil is wicked. The word wicked, uh, we use it all the time. In English, it's the word wicker. And a wicker basket is a woven basket or a twisted basket because the word wicca or wicked or wicker just means twisted. So when something is evil, it is twisted. And that's what the enemy masters in, twisting. He takes just enough truth to twist it and make it something, anything but truth. As a matter of fact, what I want to show you here for the next few minutes, and I want you to write this down and think about it, Satan really just does does three things to advance his agenda. There are three things that you've experienced likely already in your life that the enemy has done. Number one, he deceives. Number one, he deceives. He's a deceiver. Number two, he tempts. The Bible says that God tempts no man. He tempts no man with evil. That's, that's the enemy that does that. And then number three, he accuses. Now, I think for most of us, we get the temptation part. But do we understand the deception part? Deception, temptation, accusation. If you're taking notes, write that down. Deception, temptation, accusation. That's the way Satan operates to separate us from God. Now, when you look at John chapter 7, this is what Jesus says in verse 7. He says, the world cannot hate you. But me it hateth. Why, Jesus? Why would anybody hate someone that gave their lives to save them? Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So Jesus said the system, the world, the world's not a place. It's a system. It's a system of time. And, and he's saying that the system, the eon, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil evil. What, what, what is evil? It's anything that's contrary to the word, character, will, or purpose of God. So let's go back to the beginning for a quick lesson on good and evil and to see how the enemy operates because his method of operation has never changed. So I'll give you this reference and it comes from Genesis chapter 3. God creates man in his own image. God created him male and female. And he puts man in the earth and he gives man dominion over the earth. And God would give man one commandment in that garden. That was do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. And so what happens? Genesis chapter 3, verse number 4, Satan comes to the woman and, and he says, you will not surely die. He set her up real good. He said, can you eat of all the trees in the garden? And, and, and she says, well, we can have all the trees except one. God has said not to eat of that tree lest we die. And he says, oh, verse 4 of Genesis 3, he said, you will not surely die. That's deception. See, before the enemy really works his game on temptation, he begins with deception. Why? Because if the enemy can deceive you into believing something's not wrong, then it makes it easier for you to be tempted with it. So you're married, but you're not happily married because you're just not happy. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe there's something to be worked out. Maybe you lack adaptability. Maybe you lack empathy. Maybe something's going on, but it's nothing that God and his word can't work out. But right now, today, you're not satisfied. Your needs are not getting met. And somebody else is giving you attention you're not getting at home. 
So in your mind, since my spouse is not sensitive to my needs and I'm not happy, then now it's justified. Why are y'all so quiet? I'm not talking about anybody in here. See, so the enemy deceives you that this is acceptable because you're not getting treated right at home anyway. And now the temptation is stronger on your life because you have been deceived about your marriage. Y'all, y'all know I'm telling you the truth. Okay, let me give you a different example. That went over like a lead balloon. Let me give you another one. So you begin to take stuff home from the job that belongs to the company that you work for. He said, well, there's just a few ink pens, whatever. You begin to take stuff home that does not belong to you. It belongs to the company you work for, but you don't feel like they're paying you enough anyway. So since they're not paying me enough anyway, I'll just start taking this to compensate myself for all this hard work I'm pouring into this company. It's do me anyway. See, deception always comes before temptation. So what does the enemy do in Genesis 3, 4? He tells the woman, you will not surely die. There's no consequence to sin. There's no consequence to evil. There's no real death. You will not surely die. That's the lie the enemy told from the beginning. That's the lie he's still telling today. Nobody can say this is wrong. There really is no right or wrong. Only God, no, God came because there isn't a God. You do what you want to do. You do what feels good to you. You're your own God. You determine what's right. You determine what's right what's wrong. That's what he told the woman in verse four. He said, God just doesn't want you to be your own God. You will be his God if you eat this tree. Deceived her. Then in verse six of Genesis three, he says, this fruit is good for food. You don't know what you're missing. Look at it. Handle it. This fruit will make you wise. This fruit will make you like God. And the Bible says when she saw the fruit and knew that it was desired to make her wise, she then took of it and ate. What's that called? Temptation. When you look at something that's desirable and you get passion for it and your appetite for it grows, now that's temptation. I'm being lured away. I'm being drawn by lust into this thing that I may not supposed to have but if you can if the enemy can deceive you first then tempting you will come easy so watch what the devil will do so i'm gonna get to number three accusation because the book of revelation the 10th chapter calls calls satan the accuser of the brethren the 12th chapter calls satan the accuser of the brethren so watch this the same devil that will deceive you, the same devil that will tempt you into sin, when you've sinned, will come back and accuse you. Wait a minute, you deceived me into thinking I was owed this. You tempted me with it, and then I did it. And then now you're saying to me, you are a sorry piece of humanity. <laughs> Look what you did. You no good nothing. And you think you can pray? And you think you now can go to church? And you think you now should read the Bible? Oh, no, not after what you've done. See, he uses deception and temptation and accusation because Satan is only after one thing, your soul. He's after you being, you and me being separated from God. So all of these are just tools in his arsenal to separate us from God. And so the same devil that will deceive you is the same one that will tempt you and the same one that will accuse you after you took the bait. 
Which means, which means today you might have known deception. You might have known temptation. And now you're saying, you know what? This life has given me nothing and I feel like I need truth. And you go reaching for truth and all the devil does is bring up your past and bring up that stuff and those, those skeletons in your closet. And he, and he devalues you and tells you that God could never love you and that God could never use you. And after all the things you've done, you're disqualified. But I'm here to tell you today, it is for these three reasons reasons that Jesus came. He died so that my price could be paid, that my debt could be paid, that I don't have to be deceived anymore, that I don't have to be led into temptation anymore, and that the accuser of the brethren can be cast down, and I can overcome him by the blood of the lamb and say to that accusing devil, yes, I did that in my past, but you know what? The blood of Jesus has washed that from my life, and I am not who I used to be. I've been redeemed. And so Revelation tells us that we overcome the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, which means I've got to speak of his blood and of his redemption and know that I have been redeemed from my past. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, I am a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things have become brand new. You don't have to run from your past. Jesus will redeem you from it. So watch this. In verse 4, he lied to Eve. He deceived her. You will not die. There's nothing wrong with this. That's what society is trying to say about the culture we're living in. Nothing wrong with that. You, if you feels good to you, you do it. If that's your desire, it's okay. That's the enemy working his game. Then in verse 6, he tempted her. But when you go to verse 8 of Genesis 3, her and Adam are hiding. God shows up in the cool of the day to meet with them, and they are hiding, sowing fig leaves together. And, and, and God says, Adam, where are you? And when Adam was found sowing fig leaves together, hid, hid with Eve, hiding from God. God, God, God. God said, what are you doing? And Adam says, we hid ourselves because we were naked and afraid. And the Lord looked back at Adam and he said these words. He said, who told you you were naked? Who told you you needed to run from me? Who told you you better hide? Who told you that? It was Satan that told them that. And it's the same devil that tells you not to pray, not to get in the word, not to go to church because of something in your past. His ultimate objective is just to separate you and me from God. So within just a few verses of Genesis 3, we see deception, temptation, and accusation. And there's no way you've lived life after maturity and not seen those three in full operation. Where I was deceived, I, I was tempted, and then after I, I went all in, I felt guilty and, and, and shameful, and, and, and I had no peace. It's amazing to me that the society that our young people are growing up in, our boys and girls, our teenagers and children, this society of all things accepted, that's where we're at right now as a culture, is that everything's accepted and you can be whatever you want to be. And if you don't like what you are, you can be what you're not. And that's the, the message of the world today. Yet right now in America, the second leading cause of death among teenagers is suicide. So obviously, going after everything that feels good and, and indulging yourself in whatever the world can offer is not fulfilling <laughs> because what the enemy doesn't tell you is that after he has tempted you and deceived you and after he has led you into self-indulgence where you have become every twisted and perverted thing that's possible, what you're left with is shame and guilt that the world cannot wipe away and that the enemy will use to devalue you and to tell you you are worthless to your family and to society and to yourself. But I'm here to say as a minister of the gospel that there is a loving God that in your sin.
sin loves you, that in your brokenness loves you, and you have done nothing to earn this love, and you can do nothing to deserve it, but it is available to you. It's why Jesus came. Turn with me to John 3. John 3. The enemy would love to deceive you only so he can tempt you. And I can assure you if you trace your steps back and you look at the times that you fell prey to temptation, before that happened, you got deceived about that area. And that's what the enemy is advancing in this world right now. He's advancing this this hidden agenda of his that there is no good, there is no evil, there is no right, there is no wrong, there is no God, there is no standard. My truth doesn't have to be your truth and your truth doesn't have to be my truth and everything's relative and nothing is certain. I had a guy tell me that straight up. He said, you preach like there's an absolute. He said, there are no absolutes. I looked back at him. I said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> but you just told me there's no absolutes. That means you can't be sure of what you just said. You said, well, you believe in all this heaven and hell stuff. I don't believe in all that. Help yourself. I ain't taking that chance. I die and find out I was wrong. I lost nothing. You die and find out you were wrong. You lost everything. I've had folks say, oh, well, all that stuff is just metaphors. Metaphors. It's just metaphors. Jesus didn't really mean it. There's no hell. Get your metaphor self out away from me. I'm telling you right now, I, I couldn't take that chance. I needed salvation. And even though the I'm going to be real with y'all. The day I got saved, all I wanted was to be saved from hell. That was all I needed from the Lord. I didn't know what he'd do to my life. I didn't know that he'd save me from me. I didn't know that he'd save me from the wrong way of thinking. I didn't know that he'd save me from the wrong way of living. I didn't know that what he saved me to was so much better than what he saved me from. I didn't realize what all I got when I accepted Jesus in my life. Hallelujah. So in John 3, we notice, you know, the all familiar verse, verse 16. Y'all know verse 16, don't you? But how many of us keep reading after verse 16? The gospel is found in verse 16. Your salvation is in verse 16, that God sent his son to die for our sins, that we would not have to perish but have everlasting life if we would only believe. But verse 17 continues the message. Watch this. He says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus did not come to bring condemnation. Why? Because the world was already condemned. Imagine being in a house on fire and the fire department shows up and they bring deliverance and they they come in and they bring the fire hoses and the water to put the flames out and to save you. They didn't come bringing fire. The house was already on fire when they came. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. We were already condemned. He came to save us. Does that make sense? He says here in verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. If I believe on Jesus, I'm no longer condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Read that part out loud. But he that believeth not is condemned already. In other words, you don't get the, it's not an option where Jesus presents himself or the gospel and then you say, oh, decline, and then now you're condemned. No, you're already condemned. When the gospel was presented to me, 17 years old, right out of high school, I heard the gospel visiting a church because my aunt wouldn't leave me alone about coming to church. And I finally went to get her to stop inviting me. Only reason I went, she didn't leave me alone. I didn't know I was going to end up at the altar that morning on my knees praying. 
That was not my plan. But I heard the gospel and I responded. But had I not responded, I was already condemned before I heard it. See, my position was already condemned. He, that's what he's saying here in verse 18. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So if you're living an evil life, you don't want light. There have been folk that left the church, this church, other churches, and made up reasons why they left. No. You got into a sin that that preacher was dealing with and you left to escape it because you didn't want to be in church and be confronted with what you were doing in the booth in the back in the dark. Oh, I don't, I don't go there anymore. Oh, why not? Uh, they sing too much. You didn't make it for the singing anyway. You didn't leave because of no singing. See, he said, everyone that doeth evil hates the light. Neither comes to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. Now, 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 God is saying here that when you're evil, you don't want light. And the enemy certainly doesn't want there to be any light. Why? Because the light would expose that thing as evil. And if it gets exposed as evil, then you realize, okay, this is something I need to repent from. This is something I need saved from. So what's the enemy's agenda? The enemy's agenda is to get rid of the light because he don't want anybody being convicted by the wrong. Do you know the enemy don't mind you going to church as long as you don't ever get convicted? Now, can I say that one more time? The devil don't have no problem with you going to church as long as you don't get convicted by truth. The, the enemy hates the light and he's doing everything he can to rid the world of the light. So they tell you that, that you, 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 you can't bring that on your job. And you can't bring your Bible up here. And don't wear that Jesus t-shirt up here. You can wear Nike, Reebok, Under Armour, wear whatever you want to wear. Don't, don't put Jesus on that shirt, they'll get on to you. You can't wear that up here. See, that's the enemy saying, I, I got to get rid of the light. And that's what sadly the, 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 the world has come to. And even our own nation, there's so much that's going on that all it is is the enemy's way to outlaw light, to outlaw the preaching of the word. The enemy's trying to get rid of this truth. He's trying to silence the truth. Why? Because he doesn't want anybody convicted of their sin because they might get saved. So there's a war that goes on between good and evil. And it's telling you that you got to be silent and you can't preach Jesus and you can't bring prayer in, in, into these places. It's the enemy saying, take your kingdom back to Sunday morning church and leave it in that building, but don't bring it out here in the world. But it is the world that needs it. It's the world that needs the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We're called to advance this kingdom. So watch this. He says, for everyone that doeth, doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Last verse. Go with me to John 17. Church, when we get into the three domains in volume three, I, I really believe you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to see this unseen war clear. Because there's so much that goes on, and we think it's all about this or that. We think it's this and that, and all it is is good and evil. I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Can I give you all a couple of examples? I ain't going to be too long-winded. I'm almost hungry. 
Whatever is of God, Satan seeks to pervert. That's evil. So God made man in his own image. Right? All men are created equal. That's what God said. Satan says, ah, let me tweak that. I can do something with that to, to advance my agenda. So he uses a man by the name of Darwin to write a theory. And it's crazy is that even the, the, the public school system leave this part out when they teach evolution. That Darwin believed in a superior race. And that other races were inferior to the superior race. Adolf Hitler followed his doctrine, Darwin's doctrine, to such degree that it led to the Holocaust. Where he killed 11 million people that were deemed as minority, blacks, Jews. So Satan says, no, man wasn't made in the image of God. Only a certain man. Only a white man. Only this man. It's a lie. But people buy into the ideology of it and they look at you different because you don't look like them and have allowed the evil that, 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 that all men were not made in the image of God, have allowed that evil to lead to prejudice and hate. Even in church, See, Satan just wants to take whatever God created and wants to pervert it. Put a little, let me twist that. Let me twist that to work my game. Let me, let me twist that because if I can twist that, I can, I, can, I can cause this thing to lead to murder. I can cause this thing to lead to hate. I can cause this thing to lead to division. I can come and kill, steal, and destroy, John 10, 10. If I can just take a truth and twist it. And folk will look at us and judge us by not just the color of your skin, by the color of the skin of the guy sitting at your table. Oh, go, yes, amen. Go out deep with somebody don't look like you and see if folk won't look at you. I told somebody the other day, I said, folk that hate me and say all this crazy mess and hate word of God, it ain't because we're, we're black or white or white preacher or black. It ain't got nothing to do with it. It's integration that they hate. They hate the idea that white folk, black folk, Asian folk, Hispanic folk can come together and love one another and worship the same Jesus. That's what they hate because it violates the narrative of Satan. Can I give you another one? So God takes man and woman and creates marriage and says, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, replenish the earth. And God says, I'm going to bring you together. And I'm gonna, I, this, this man has a womb and, and has the ability to bring forth child. And this man has seed that can impregnate this woman and, and they can multiply. And I call that marriage. Satan says, no, no, no. You ain't got to be a man and a woman to be married. You can be a woman and a woman, a man with a man. And after 6,000 years of human history, a few judges thought they had the power to redefine what God had already solidified from the very beginning. Is it really because man need to be with man and marry? No, it's Satan saying, I take whatever's of God, I pervert it, I twist it, it's evil. But the enemy don't want this being preached. Oh, no, you think it wants what I just said being preached? No. And when you think he couldn't go no further, God, Jesus, Matthew 19, 6 says, in the beginning, God made them male and female, simple as that. When we celebrate, when we do the, 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 the sonogram and find out it's a boy because the stem was on apple and we have the reveal party and we, and we do the blue balloons or the pink balloons and we say, it's a boy. My wife and I had four children. The first three, we knew what they were because of, you know, going in. But the fourth one, we decided to wait, and we didn't know until the baby came out, and I'm standing right there, and Chris is giving birth, and there come Mila. Hey, it's a girl. It wasn't no, it's a, I don't know yet. She's a girl, and she's a beautiful girl, and she was ordained by God to be a girl. She could have been a boy, but God made her a girl, and she's beautiful, and she's wonderfully made. But this twisted world we live in is trying to deceive our children in believing that maybe God made a mistake. Really, you're not a boy. Maybe you're supposed to be a girl. It is deception to lure you into temptation. It's an evil. 
I'm not saying this out of hate because I haven't met anybody I don't love. I'm saying this because it is deception that is leading to evil. There's not a soul I don't love. And even if you're here today and you're confused, if you're here today and you say, I don't know what I am, I'm here to tell you the truth. I don't have no agenda. I just want you to know the truth. There's a loving God who made you the way you are. And he did not make a mistake. The enemy's trying to deceive you so he can tempt you, only so he can destroy you. It's a simple battle between good and evil. Let me wrap this up in John 17. But the church wants to be silent because we want to be politically correct. And that's how political correctness got so much power, is the church stay quiet. History records that when the rail when the railroad cars, box cars, were filled with people that were told they were headed to a better life and they were put in box cars to go to this community where there were better jobs and better pay and men and women and children got on those box cars and they didn't find out till the doors were closed that that's not where they were going. They were going to gas chambers. History records the churches that were nested along the tracks, when the trains passed by and they could hear the people crying in the boxcars, they would stop whatever they were doing and sing louder so they wouldn't have to hear the scream. And that's what's wrong with the church today is we're singing louder, but we don't see there's a problem in this world. There's brokenness in this world. There is an evil that is in this world that needs salvation. But we're so concerned about being politically correct, we won't say nothing. All right, watch this in John 17. And when we get to this third volume, you're going to see that the enemy is using government to make gospel illegal. That's what all this whole thing is really all about. It ain't nothing new. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, looked at a Hebrew boy named Daniel who was in exile, who he took and wouldn't even let him have his own name and tried to indoctrinate him with Babylonian custom. But Daniel had been raised right and he said, no, I don't eat that. Eat what I eat and see if you ain't healthier. And he had such an excellent spirit that, 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 that Daniel was preferred. Nebuchadnezzar preferred him over 120 of his presidents and made him a ruler in a Babylonian kingdom, a Hebrew, that was hostile to his faith. And he's done went to the top. And all them folk that he passed up, they said, oh, we got to do something about this. He's got too much influence around here. And so they went and lobbied the king. Yeah, I use that right word, and I'll talk more about that later. They went, they went and lobbied the king. And they said, oh, king, you know there's nobody like you. Never been a kingdom like yours. They butted him all up, wrote him checks. <laughs> they said, you ought to make a new law. Matter of fact, we went ahead and wrote it for you. This is the way we want it worded. You ought to make a new law that if any man dare pray to anyone other than you, for 30 days, he'd be thrown in the lion's den. Who dares seek anyone other than you, great king? And so the king signed it in the law. And they said, now we got him. If you read Daniel 6, this is what they said about Daniel. They said, we can't find nothing wrong with him. Well, I wish I had time. They said, we can't find nothing wrong with him. We can't find nothing wrong with him. What's really wrong with the church in America? When tragedy hits, many times it's a church that's there before government shows up. You, you, you look at, at, at neighborhoods that have been hit by tornadoes and floods. Who's there when it happens and who's there long after it happened? Church folk giving and sowing and serving. What's really wrong with church? 
They said, we can't find nothing wrong with this, Daniel. And if you read Daniel 6, that's what they said. They said, unless, un except it be a, with the law of his God. They said, we don't, we don't like the law of his God. Like Daniel, he's an awesome dude, but that law he preaches, we don't like that. We got to make his law illegal. And got the sent king to sign it. Because they knew Daniel feared God above man. And so they walked past his window. And sure enough, three times a day, like he always did, they said, yep, he's up there praying. And they went and carried the paperwork back to the king. They said, King, you signed this in the law. And we just caught him praying. If you're going to be a righteous king, if you're going to be an honorable king, if you're going to be a strong king, you got to do what you said. And the king threw Daniel in the lion's den. And it grieved him all night. He couldn't even sleep. He paced himself, wondering what was going on with Daniel. But see, we ought to obey God rather than man. Because the next morning... When they went in and looked and opened up the doors to see Daniel, Daniel done made himself a catnap. That's where the word catnap came from. Daniel became a lion tamer. And the lion was laid there and Daniel done taken himself a nap and he had not been eaten because God held the lion's mouth shut. Come on, somebody. But what was the kingdom trying to do, make Daniel's light illegal. And make no mistake about it, in America today, there's stuff going on right now, happen, something just happened just this week, and all it really is about, it ain't about all this other stuff, it's really about one thing, making this preaching illegal. We, we, we need to see the unseen war. We, we're not really seeing what's really going on. Let me wrap this up. John 17, I'm almost done. Watch this. Jesus prays for you and I. In verse 14, he says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. But look what Jesus does in verse 15. He says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Don't take them out of the world. I need them in the world. But that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. That's his prayer because evil is a reality. And so Jesus prays the Father. He said, Father, don't take him out of the world. We need him in the world. We're going to use him to advance the kingdom. But keep him from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, separate them, make them different through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the word of God that makes us different. It's the word of God that sanctifies us. It's the word of God that separates us from the world. Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God because that's what I'm called to advance the will of God as it is in heaven in the earth and that's what the enemy is trying to stop in our lives that's the unseen war let me pray for you this morning father we thank you today for your word and lord if there be one person here right now God that's been deceived or being tempted or being accused Lord, I thank you for freedom today in the name of Jesus. I thank you for salvation today in the name of Jesus. I invite you to pray this prayer with me today. I can lead you into prayers, but it requires your faith. Pray with me. Those watching this live feed, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I believe your word. And I receive what Jesus did for me. That I could be delivered from deception, temptation, and accusation. I ask forgiveness of my sins. Of anything I've allowed in my life. That was contrary to your word and will. I ask forgiveness. I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe you sent your son, Jesus, to die for my sins so that I could live for you. I believe you raised him from the dead 
that I could have eternal life and walk in newness of life. So I ask right now that you would fill me with your spirit, that you would give me wisdom, discernment, and power to live a life that advances your kingdom and brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.